Alicia. It is now my pleasure to introduce our last speaker, last but not least for sure, um, Lilia Luciano. Lilia Luciano is an investigative reporter for ABC 10 Sacramento. She was also the chief investigative correspondent for Discovery Channel's Border Live and has been a correspondent and host at Vice, NBC News, and Univision. She's the director and producer of War of Others, an HBO Latino film on the environmental, health, and security consequences of the war on drugs in Colombia. Her work has earned her multiple regional Emmy Awards, the Regional Edward R. Murrow Award, and a GLAAD Award. Please join me in welcoming Lilia to the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Is this on? Yeah, it's on. Okay. I love hearing my bio because I still feel like I'm in college and haven't learned anything. Um, imposter syndrome. I, I wanted to show a little bit of my work first just so you have an idea of like where, like the kind of work that I do. So this is my first two minute of my reel. Oh no, no audio. Is there audio? Yeah. Did I start over? You can, you know, whatever. That's Michael K. Williams. He's a badass. There it is. It's nearly 100 degrees, and I'm squeezed into a car packed with 400 gallons of contraband gas. Okay. Anybody got a smoke? You know, it's against all odds, man. And Lilia Luciano, she found that out firsthand when she went on the gas smuggling run in Colombia. 140 kilometers per hour in this tiny car filled with 400 gallons of gas. There's quite a bit of conflict going on here. Just now, we're, we're returning to the campground. So how long is this tunnel? To the border? Probably, you're looking at 120 feet. What kind of dangers do agents face other than obviously, you know, encountering someone who might be armed well, down here? Well, there could be uh, rodents, scorpions, spiders. Here? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. This is pretty gross. So we heard that there are people crossing now. Did they cross? So they say you just apprehended a person that just crossed to the east of this hill that we're yeah. at? Get out. Tony, get out. He's, he's, he's just, just going into a tunnel. Hey. We saw the agent get out of his car and start running around here, and uh, immediately I noticed that he noticed something and he ran over there into that drainage pipe. I don't know what his intentions are, right. but he's coming not to do to smuggle drugs in this yeah. particular he's incident. He's migrating to the U.S. Not so this would be an economical migrant. We're in Edinburgh, South Texas. This is about 10 miles away from the border with Reynosa, with Mexico and McAllen. This truck stop is a popular spot for coyotes to drop off migrants. That's when they get in, and they climb up in there, and they slide in the very back. So Mateo has agreed to take me hiding in his truck so we can get as close as possible to the experience that migrants undergo. You can see how Great invisible action. people can get. This is the place to hide. Now it starts to get cold. This is where the drugs come to die. Right now, this... Okay. I'm gonna pause it because I think you get an idea of what I do. So basically what I do is I put myself in as dangerous situations as possible. I try to live life through the eyes of other people. I try to cohabit and become as intimate as possible with the stories that I cover. Um, I love getting you know, down, dirty, into dangerous situations, but it wasn't always like that. Are you seeing the glam photos? <laughs> so when I started my career, my grandmother told me, who had worked in television her, her whole life, you have to take every opportunity and do the best you can. It's a difficult in industry, and opportunities are scarce. I'm sure it's the case for most industries. And so I started working in entertainment. I had a shot. I grabbed a mic. I was freaked out. I suffered from, as we all do, imposter syndrome. But it had only been, I mean, I had only done an internship for a little bit the first time I went on camera. So I was freaking out, but I was like, fake it till you make it. I made it pretty quickly. I got offered a job as an entertainment host in Univision and this like The View style show where I just would talk about celebrities and tour with people as fabulous as like Enrique Iglesias. And it was a great job, 
But you know, I come from a family of people who are attorneys, who are politicians, who are artists, activists. My mom's a social worker, my dad's a doctor. So I knew that in the world of entertainment, where it didn't matter how smart the stories I was doing uh, were, it didn't matter uh, how impactful or meaningful or inspiring they were, what really mattered was who was dressing me for the red carpet. Um, sometimes the jokes that I would tell, like my bosses would say, that joke is way too highbrow. So the, I had this big, you know, kind of gaping hole in, in, in my spirit where I, I thought, you know, I studied journalism um, for, you know, four years. I've worked really hard. Sometimes I wouldn't sleep uh, for three days in a row producing great stories just to be told that my wardrobe sucked or my hair wasn't big enough. So I rebelled and I started fighting while at Univision. I want a shot at news. I want a shot at news. I want a shot at news. Um, I had an opportunity to go to the World Cup and I started making all these stories that were a little bit more meaningful. Uh, stories about culture, about poverty, about nonprofits that were doing great stuff, about the apartheid. And somebody in leadership uh, sent someone to tell me, tell that girl, I don't know who she thinks she is, but she's an entertainment person and not to be confused. So I got the message, there's not going to be a shot at me at news, and obviously people who, I don't know, dress well at the red carpet can't also do smart stories, and also, you know, perhaps people who are doing entertainment don't want to learn. This, you know, was kind of the nature of the role, um, of being typecast, of being like, you can't do both things. And so I rebelled against that. I put together a reel with all those South Africa stories, and I decided to get into news. I sent the reel to everyone I knew. But I did it my way. I got into news with like a cosmopolitan cover. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to do serious news right after I step off this sexy ass dress. Um, and so I went to a network. They called me. They saw my reel. I went to NBC News. And the news came out that I was going to do general market news for the biggest news network in the country. I was coming from Spanish language entertainment at 25. Nobody had ever done anything even similar to that. All the correspondents who get to the network and news, they start at a small market, they get to a medium market, they get to a large market. If they're lucky, and especially female, and they're not over the age of 35, maybe they get a shot at the network, right? Which, I'm turning 35 this year, I get the pressure. Um, you know, television is not very forgiving. I had this huge opportunity, I took it. But the moment I get to NBC, I experience the worst case of imposter syndrome anybody could ever think of. So now I'm in, I fooled everyone, I went through all the interviews, they think I know what I'm gonna do, I have no clue. Like I, I studied journalism, I knew production, walking in I knew that I was capable of doing the job but every day in it I started looking around and it's like, I'm the only person whose second language is English here. I'm the only person who, when you Google them, they're like wearing miniskirts and big hair. I started getting embarrassed about my personal path and my personal journey and my story and what I didn't know. I knew how to write a, a new story, a package, but suddenly everything became so daunting. But I would do the work. I would show up, I would pitch, I would you know, ask questions. I was working so hard because I needed to prove to everyone from where I came to, to where I was, to my family, to everyone that I can do this. I can, you know, stand up to the challenge. And about a year and a half into my experience there, you know, after all the announcement had been made and the big Cosmo cover and here's this person breaking every ceiling, uh, I changed my look, obviously, to be a little more newsy. Um, I start swimming. I start, you know, excelling. I start doing a really good job. And then one day, I'm covering the Trayvon Martin story, which was one of the most, I would say, controversial stories at the time, one of the most, uh, the stories that raised the most passions. Uh, it was the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement. It was a story about race and about guns, two topics that individually, obviously, uh, activate American passions. And here I am, sent out to one of the biggest stories ever, and um, I get told, you know, have your, producer, you've been doing, I was doing like 23 live shots every day for a bunch of different stations for everyone. I think even the Weather Channel was covering. It was crazy. I was on the hour, every hour, MSNBC. Great deal of pressure. And I'm told like, your story for tonight, producer's going to write it, just, you know, whatever, voice it when it's ready. I felt a little uncomfortable because I wanted people to know that I'm writing, that I'm doing my job. So producer takes over. 
I do the story, the next day it comes out on the air. I remember I went on vacation, and when I come back from vacation, actually a few weeks went by, there's this whole rumor going around that apparently NBC News is editorializing their stories to make George Zimmerman seem more of a racist than he actually is. And uh, it turns out that the way one of those stories that I did was edited, and then that mistake was prolonged in other stories, kind of edited the the call from 911, and I can get into the details when we're networking after because it's very technical, I don't have that much time. But basically there was this big journalistic mistake that had been done uh, in the edit booth in Miami while I was in Orlando. But as a news correspondent, you understand that in the same way that you take credit for the work of a lot of people, you also have to take the blame. So after the massive success that I had lived through a year and a half before and breaking all the ceilings, suddenly every newspaper, every media blog, Everyone that I was paying attention to in the industry was announcing that I messed up, I was getting fired. I love that they use that fabulous photo. It's kind of like, of course she did it. She's not a news person, she's a red carpet diva. Um, my name became toxic and I spent the next four years of my life trying to rebuild my name. I. I went to every network, I went to newspapers, I went everywhere I could to try and get another job in news, but now everybody came back and said, no, your name is toxic. So that was the beginning of a four to, f four to five year long crash where I had to come up with a job of my own. Um, I was no longer gonna go back to entertainment because I knew that wasn't fulfilling. Perhaps there would have been options there, but I really wanted to tell stories about the things that pissed me off. I wanted to have an impact in the world. I wanted to find my own voice and, and connect people to one another, and I knew that I had some talent to do it. So that's when I used my savings, went to um, Columbia, did a documentary about the war on drugs, came back, sold it to HBO. Suddenly they want to do it. And now I'm like directing this team of about 12 people I've never directed in my life. Again, <laughs> imposter syndrome. Again, <gasps> what am I gonna do? I start hearing all the voices in my head of the people who had said, she's not a news person, she's not even a storyteller. She's a you know red carpet diva. She doesn't know what she's doing. And I walk into this whole process of, I don't know what I'm doing. What, who am I fooling? I don't, I don't even know how to stand in front of a camera. Um, I gave up, I, I, this documentary was supposed to be like me telling the story as I usually do, and suddenly they say, no, let's do it, you know, you're off camera. And then suddenly they say, actually, we need a real director, so after I finish my whole film, uh, the network brings in this male famous director who was very well known in Colombia where they wanted to go in and start uh, putting documentaries out in that market. So I'm like, okay, okay, sure, sure, sure. I'll, let's just get the movie done because I really want those people's stories to get out. At the same time, uh, Vice had seen my work and they start hiring me um, as a host and then one day I hear from a friend, hey, by the way, the people who were hiring you had no idea about the NBC thing, so now it's come from the top, you're toxic, you have no credibility, and so they're not gonna hire you again, and they really never called back. So now I am in New York, crossing my fingers, hoping to get any job. I used up my 401k, I used up my, all of my savings. I say, I'm gonna go to school. So I applied to Columbia to get in, and I mean, to, to get into the master's program in journalism, but like with no money. So at the moment where I'm about to start school and get into student debt, I get this call from my agent who says, hey, there's an opportunity fortunately had not abandoned me. <laughs> I adore him for it. Hey, there's an opportunity in local news in Sacramento. And I was like, is that in Arizona? Like, <laughs> what do you mean Sacramento, local news? Uh, I've never done that. I am you know, still believing that I need these big brands and these big names to like prove myself to the world that like, no, look, I am the one that succeeds. I still should get these shots. And I, at that time, my grandmother had died. And I'm at her funeral, you know, thinking about this possible job interview that I have in Sacramento and thinking like, oh no, local news, what's, what message is that gonna send? I thought I was a network person. And I think, actually, she would tell me, you have to take that job. Um, you know, if you wanna do your master's, it's always gonna be there if you ever eventually wanna teach. It was a job as an investigative reporter. I come to the station and they're all like in awe of my work and they're like, we don't care about this 
you know, stuff that's out there. We know you didn't do it. We want you to bring you here. Um, I'm like, all right, I'll take the job. And the past three years of my life have been uh, the greatest lesson uh, that I could gather professionally as a journalist, as a, as a person of my own too, as a woman. What I learned walking into this job that I've been doing as an investigative reporter, reporting on local stories, having a real local impact, finding my voice, not having to dress up or down or like get a neck tattoo because someone at Vice thought that was gonna be cool, um, which I don't have, I just, I have hidden tattoos. I learned three things. First, humility. I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, there is so much to learn in every field when you just kind of put your, health, your head down to the ground and say, I'm just gonna do the work. I'm not gonna think about the brands, I'm not gonna think about the titles, I'm not gonna think about the awards. I'm just gonna do the work. That's what I'm here for. I want to use my voice and my talents and my skills and my passions towards something bigger than myself. I have had, I cry all the time when I get these messages. So many homeless people who reach out to me on Facebook and say, hey, that story you did for me, it was very helpful. You know, mothers who are fighting custody battles, who are domestic violence victims tell me, that story you did, this really changed the perception of the people who didn't believe me. I won an Emmy for a documentary I did in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, which is the piece of work that I'm the proudest of in my entire life. It was the most difficult, the most challenging project that I've ever done, but it you know, earned me the award, which by the time I had earned it, it was like, oh, great, cool, but it was the work that was really satisfying. I learned that the only way to beat imposter syndrome, there's no substitute for hard work is really doing the work, is doing the research, is getting to know the topic better than anyone, is practicing, is learning to edit, is learning to shoot, is learning really to own the position, even if you think at the beginning that it's you know, somehow beneath you because it doesn't have the big shiny brands. And the most important lesson, which I had le started learning before that, I started meditating. Um, I read this book by this ABC News uh, correspondent named uh, Dan Harris called 10% Happier. And it's all about meditation and mindfulness. And I had started meditating. And the thing that I discovered working in this local news job was, wait a second, I thought this whole time, because I had allowed myself to feed off of the magazines and the covers and the highs and the lows and the huge failures and the toxicity and what other people say and do is that I completely forgot throughout this whole journey why it was that I was doing what I was doing. Why I'm doing it is because I get to use my talent to connect with human beings, my passion for social injustice, for things that really upset me and piss me off and I want to do something about, and the experience that I have in production, to do something for other people. And the thing that I enjoy is when I am focused on the story, when I'm not letting myself getting dragged by the past history or pulled by the desire of who I want to become and the shiny objects and the big names and the big networks. And last year, it actually happened that I, it once again, was at the perfect place, at the perfect time where somebody had seen my work and I had continued producing and just doing the job and I was hired to do this Discovery Channel show that was so big. Um, and I had spent all of my time before that kind of get, becoming qualified, kind of learning the craft, relearning it, developing the passion for my work. And by the time they called me and said, hey, we want you to do this big network show and da 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 for the first time, I didn't feel imposter syndrome. For the first time, I knew that I was doing it because I cared about what was happening at the border, because I knew and I had studied and I understood the stories that needed to be told because I was good at connecting with human beings on an intimate level and telling their stories and translating their passion and taking people into a journey into where things happen and develop that empathy. And then the show got canceled, so. <laughs> Once again, it's me and failure, like, hi, we know each other, we're so familiar with each other already. But this time around, it was like, all right, back to the drawing board. The thing that I've discovered through my you know, multiple successes and failure is that really I'm in it for the ride, that mindfulness has become my best friend, that when I'm getting exasperated because I don't know what I'm gonna do next, 
or I don't want people to Google me because they're going to see failure everywhere. All of that is false. The only thing that matters is the present. Um, in that book that changed my life, that uh, taught me about the importance of mindfulness and meditation, he said, you know, when we have a foot in the past and a foot in the future, what you're doing is pissing on the present. And so, <laughs> to me, in this whole journey, whatever happens tomorrow, I have the tool to defeat imposter syndrome. That's hard work. I have the passion for what I do because it takes me to interact with special people, and especially because I get to do something that's much greater than myself. And I have the mindfulness to understand that like, the past doesn't define me, and the future is not even real. It's not even here. So I hope that as all of you confront those situations, imposter syndrome, and you know, fear of the unknown, and people telling you, oh, no, that's not for you. You say, you know what, screw it. Um, if I have the passion for it, if I have the skills, or if I want to learn the skills and train myself, uh, that's all really, that's all that matters. You don't need to follow anybody else's footsteps. And definitely meditate 20 minutes a day at least. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> Thank you.